And how are you doing? I'm Teacher Faith, and thank you so much for joining us for worship time. We have been learning lessons about how Jesus saves us moment by moment. And today is day five. So if you haven't watched that, please make sure you catch up with us, okay? So that you don't miss out on the beautiful lessons you have been learning. I have an activity and I want all of us to, to participate in this activity. So I'm going to give you clues. I have something in mind. I'm thinking about something. I'm going to give you clues. And if you think you know what I have in mind, you tell me what it is. Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, great. So I'm thinking about something that everyone has. So everybody in the world has it. And if you don't use it, you lose it. And it makes us feel strong. What am I thinking about, yes? Words, uh-huh, yes. Courage, uh-huh. Somebody else, everybody has it. If we don't use it, we lose it. And it makes us feel strong. Five, four, three, yes. Talent, what did you say? Muscles, yeah, let's clap for him. He got it right, yeah, muscles. <laughs> when we don't use our muscles, we lose them. And when we lose them, we get so weak, right? So today we are going to talk about some special power that we have in our minds that when we don't use it right, we become very weak, even in our relationship with God. But before we learn about it, we're going to sing two songs. Today we're going to sing two songs. And I want each one of us to stand as we sing these songs. Very simple songs, okay? All right, so the first one goes like, Who made you and me? You and me. You and me. Who made you and me? It's our Father God, the flying birds. Who made the flying birds? The flying birds. The flying birds. Who made the flying birds? It's our Father God, the swimming fish. Who made the swimming fish? The swimming fish. The swimming fish. Who made the swimming fish? It's our Father God. You sang so well. Indeed, God is the one who created all of us. The second song, do you usually feel like your problems are too big that God cannot help you? Do you usually feel that way sometimes? That you're so burdened and you don't even know what to do. Do you know that God is bigger than our problems? So you're going to sing a song about that. And this is how it goes. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. He made the trees. He made the seas. He made the elephants too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. There's nothing my God cannot do. There's nothing my God cannot do for you and for me. You sang so well. So, let's pray before you sit. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so, so much for giving us another privilege to come here to learn from you. Please stay with us. Help us understand these lessons so that we can be able to apply them in our lives. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
So the topic for our lesson today is the gift of freedom. Say that. The gift of freedom. And we're going to learn about two people in the Bible who used their gift of freedom well. And their stories come from the book of Daniel chapter 1. And the other one comes from the book of Matthew chapter 4 from verse 1 to 11. So Daniel and his family lived in Jerusalem. And they loved and worshipped God. Daniel was taught things from the Holy Scriptures since he was a little boy until he was a teenager. He was taught how to take care of his body because the Bible says something about our bodies in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It says, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Huh? Our body, the temple? What does that mean? It means your body is a house for God. When you choose Jesus to be your friend, he comes and he lives in your heart. And your heart is his house. Remember yesterday we learned that he's standing at the door and he's knocking. Yes, he wants to come into your heart to live there. So one day, the watchman in Jerusalem saw a great army from afar. It was the army of Babylon. They were coming to attack the people of Israel. And so these people came, this army came, and they surrounded, the, they surrounded the walls around, and after some days they were able to break in and they got into Jerusalem. And when they got there, they went into the palace, they stole precious things from the palace, and they also stole precious things from the temple. And they took some people to be slaves with them. So they took them and they made them prisoners, they chained them, and among these people were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And after a long trip, they got to Babylon. They were so tired, but after some time, the king wanted all the prisoners and all the slaves to be brought to him. And he looked at them and he was like, hmm, these boys look strong and they look good. I'm wondering if I can have a few of them to work in my government. I know Israelites are bright, so I'll take a few of them and then I'll train them, I'll train them for three years and then they can work in my government. So the king ordered that they look for boys who are well built, who are intelligent and who are talented. And among the boys who were chosen, Daniel and his three friends were brought to the king. And when they were brought there, they were assigned a captain for them. Their captain was called Captain Melza. And so Captain Melza told them, uh, you guys have been privileged, you're going to dine with the king. How would you feel if you are told that you're going to eat with, who would you like to eat with? The president. How would you feel if you're told that you're going to eat dinner at the state house tonight? How would you feel? How would you feel? You'd feel good, right? You wouldn't feel scared. I think I would get so confused. Okay, I'd get excited and then I won't eat because I'm so excited and then after that I'll wonder why I didn't eat. Anyway. So they were told that they were going to eat with the king at the palace. And so they went. And when Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah looked at the table, they were like, hmm, this food, hmm, I'm not sure I'm going to eat this food. Because, one, the food that was at the king's table was food that had been prayed for to gods who are not the living God. And if you ate that food, it meant that you're worshipping those gods. Number two, part of the food that was on the table was food that God had commanded the Israelites not to eat. So Daniel and his three friends decided, 
We are not going to eat this food. And this is what the Bible says. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 says, Daniel purposed in his heart or in his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. And after he decided, him and his three friends, they went to Captain Melza and they told him, Captain, thank you very much for the privilege you've given us to go and eat with the king. It feels so nice. You're making us feel so special. But we would request if you can give us um, vegetables and fruits and beans and peas. And instead of wine, if you can give us water, would, would really be okay with that kind of food. And Captain Melzer was like, no, 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 I can't do that. The king will be angry with me. I might even lose my job. I can't do that. And then Daniel, God gave Daniel wisdom. And Daniel told him, um, how about you still give us what we have asked, and then you can test us after 10 days. If we are weak and sick, then you can give us the king's food. And so the captain was like, are you sure? No, you guys will be weak and you'll be sick and the king will not be happy. But they prayed and the captain agreed. So they were allowed to have their vegetables and their fruits and water. And after 10 days, they were tested. You see, children, they were not just eating. They were eating and praying as well. They trusted that God was going to bless them, for they obeyed him. And so, after 10 days, Captain Melza came, and he looked at them, and they were glowing. They were actually a bit, they had gained a bit of weight, and they looked better than the other boys. And when they were taken to the king, and they were tested, they became 10 times better than the other boys. Wow, how did that happen? Was it magic? Here's what the Bible says. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 30, the Bible says, God says, For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Oh, so... If I am not embarrassed about God, if I'm not ashamed about worshiping God, then God will actually lift me up. God will actually favor me. And that's exactly what he did to Daniel. Now, children, you see, sometimes we might go to some places and, and people are free to do what they want. And maybe sometimes our parents are not there and we feel like, ah, because dead your mom is not here, I can just indulge or I can just watch this movie, or I can just play this game. Even in those moments when you are afraid that you might lose your friends, if you stand firm for God and say, I'm not playing that game, if you stand firm and say, I'm not having that drink, if you stand firm and say, I'm not watching that movie, God will still favor you and you'll even get better friends. Now, let me tell you about this other person. This other person is Jesus. After Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit led him into the desert to be tested. And he prayed and fasted for 40 nights and 40 days. Ha! Huh? That's one month and 10 other days. That's a long time. I can't, I don't think I can go without food for, I think the most I have gone without food is three days. Can I do one week? I don't know. But Jesus did 40 days and 40 nights. And then the devil came to tempt him. He came to trick him. He told him, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And you see, Jesus was very hungry. He had not eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. And now he was tired. But he told Satan, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that God says. And now Satan was like, mm, let me try one more time. Let me try something else. Then Satan took him to, um, to the temple. And then he told him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Because the Bible says 
that he's going to send his angels to hold you. You will not fall down. You won't even hurt your foot. And then Jesus told him, it is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. And Satan was not tired. He went to trick him again. He took him to such a high mountain. And then he showed him the kingdoms in the world. And he told him, if you bow down and worship me, I'm going to give you all this. And Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written that you shall worship the Lord God only. And Satan gave up and left him alone. Now, children, I have noticed something. You see, Daniel and his friends were under pressure, but they still obeyed God. They were saying no to the king, which meant the king would have actually killed them. But they still chose to trust in God, and God protected them even after they obeyed him. And now for Jesus, he was hungry, he was tired, and nobody was watching him. You know, he would have just turned the stones into bread and eaten, and nobody would have known he was alone in the desert. But he chose to obey God even when nobody was watching. Daniel and his three friends chose to obey God even in a faraway land. You know, they would have said, our oh, daddy and mommy are not here. They wouldn't know that we ate from, from the king's table. So we can just eat a little uh, so that the king doesn't get angry. Don't we do that sometimes when our friends are trying to initiate us into things that are harmful? And then we are like, but you know, she's my friend. She will feel bad. Let me just do it a little. And then I will not do it again. I'm just doing a little. I'm just doing a little. I won't do it again. That's what we do. But from these two people, we can learn, rather five people, we can learn that when we choose to obey God, even if it is very scary, even if it means we are going to die, God is able to protect us now or even if we die. He can still give us life. He will make us alive again when he comes the second time. So I think I know what made them have the freedom to say no to the devil. It's called will. Say will. will. Not will, will. Great. It's a power that we have in our minds. You see, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them free will. Meaning, when they were making their choices, they would ask, is this right or is this wrong? Based on what God had taught them. But when they listened to the devil and they sinned, they did wrong against God, their will stopped being free. So now they were controlled by their feelings, what they wanted. So when they had to make a choice, they would think about, how do I feel about this? Do I like it? If I like it, I'll do it. If I don't like it, I won't do it, even if it's the right thing. So their will stopped being free. And all of us, when we are born, none of us has free will. But God is kind. He does not want us to suffer or to get lost forever. When Jesus came to this world, he, ta he changed, he made it possible for us to have our will be repaired. How does that happen? When you accept the new life that we learned about, and the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, you give your will to God. When you give your will to God, he repairs it and gives it back to you when it has power and love. Wow! So that means when the Bible says that we do not have a spirit of fear, we have a spirit of love, power, and sound mind, it's actually true. When you make Jesus your friend, you have power and you have love. So when you make your decisions, you make your decisions based on, is this right? Will this make God happy? Okay? But how do we make our will function? Okay, fine. God has returned it to us. How do we make it work? Remember how we learned about if we don't use our muscle, we lose it and we get weak? This is what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13. 
Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Ah, so we are to work out something. So it's not just physical exercise. We are to work out our salvation. But I thought salvation is free. That when we become the friend of Jesus now, everything is free. So we have some work to do, right? Yeah, that's what I hear the Bible say. That we are to work, and it's not other people's salvation. So we're not to look at people's lives and how they're living their lives. No, it's our own salvation. And we're going to memorize that Bible verse so that we don't forget it. We're going to memorize um, verse 12, the second part. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let's say that together. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. From which book? Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Oh, let's try it one more time. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Okay, say it by yourselves right here. Oh, fantastic. So, the will, you remember, the special mental power that we have when Jesus returns it back to us, he gives it back to us when it is packed with love and power and a sound mind. So, people who follow God are not crazy. Never say, you know, I'm crazy. No, 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 you're not crazy, okay? People who follow God have a sound mind. Do you have a sound mind? Yes, we all have a sound mind. So I'm going to share with you a few steps that you need to follow to make sure that your will favors you when you're tempted, okay? To make sure that you have freedom when you're tricked by the devil. Do you usually get tricked by the devil? Do you usually get tricked by the devil? Yeah, to be tricked means to be tempted. Older children, to be tricked means to be tempted. Okay. So how do we work out of our will? Number one, learn what is right. You see, you can't know what is right unless you learn it. You can't know what is right for God unless you read the Bible. So you need to learn what is right from where? from the Bible, because this is God's word. And then number two, plan to do what is right. What is number two? What was number one? Learn what is right. Number one is? Number two is plan to do what is right. You see, Jesus and Daniel did not just start saying no to the devil when, when, when they were tempted. They started saying no when they were still young. They started obeying when they were still young. And in the little, little things that our parents ask us to do. For example, if you know that you're supposed to be making your bed, you're not to only wait until your parent comes or until your parent asks, that's when you make your bed. If you know that it's your duty to make your bed, Learn to make your bed even when nobody is watching and give it your best. If you know it's your duty to do dishes or to arrange shoes, give it your best. Do it when nobody is watching. The more you do that, the more you're building your muscle for your mind so that when you get a greater test, you can be able to have freedom to say no to the devil like Jesus and like Daniel. And you have to plan in your heart. For example, if you know maybe your parents have taught you that there are some programs which are not safe for you to watch, you need to plan in your heart that if I go visit my friends and they are watching this program, I'll say no 
and I'll walk away. Or this is what I'm going to do. Don't wait until you're tested. Then that's when you're trying to say, but I can just watch this one time. You know, they can tell you you can pray and God can forgive you. But the Bible says that we are not to test God, right? Okay, the third step is ask God to help you. What was the first step? What was the first step? Learn what is. The second step, plan to do. The third step is ask God to help you. Prayer. Jesus prayed. Daniel and his three friends prayed. You cannot say no to temptation by saying, I am strong. I'll watch it and I'll control myself. Or I will just sip a little alcohol and I am smart. I'm healthy. I'll control myself. Or I can't get really drunk. I'll just drink a little alcohol and I'll be fine. You cannot play with sin, children. Okay? You can't play with fire. It will burn you. So number one, learn what is right. Number two, plan to do what is right. Number three, ask God to help you. Number four, just do what is right. What is number four? Just do what is right. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Just do what is right. Okay? And God is going to favor you. He's going to bless your obedience. And if you feel ashamed, even Jesus will feel ashamed on you when he comes back the second time. But if you choose to stand for him, the angels will support you and you'll have courage to stand to the end. Let me see. How many of you would like, would like Jesus to repair their will? Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for creating us with advanced minds. And thank you that even when we sin, you still have a plan to restore a mind that can love and obey you. Thank you for the promise that if we give you our will, you give it back, packed with love and power. We give our will to you this evening, God, and we are believing and receiving a repaired will that we can be able to have strength to say no to the evil one. Help us remember what we have learned and please prepare our hearts for your soon return. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm so glad you are able to join us in today's lesson. I'll see you again tomorrow. May the Lord keep you. Bye-bye.